Hi, I'm Robert Sainz, and I'm here at the studios of Metro East Community Media with Congressman Earl Blumenauer, here today with us to discuss the legislation he's introduced and some of our transportation issues for East County. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate your hospitality again. It's wonderful to have you here. I know you're a great fan of Metro East, and you support us so much. Um, so basically, I think a lot of the people at home wonder exactly what your district covers. So where, where are your... That's a, that's a good point, Robert. As you know, uh, congressional boundary lines shift uh, every 10 years because of changes in population. And some parts of the state grow faster than others, and so they normalize it. Uh, this uh, district has always included um, everything east of the Willamette River, uh, all the way to the top of Mount Hood. Um, it includes some of Clackamas County. Um, recently, it has been changed to add a lot of downtown Portland, uh, the Health Science University, Lewis and Clark College. Um, but it's for the people uh, in your viewing area, it, it remains the same. This is sort of the heart of the 3rd Congressional District geographically. Okay, that's great. And, and how long have you been the representative for this district? You know, it's hard for me to uh, believe, but it has been 18 years that I have represented the 3rd Congressional District. That's incredible because I remember you as a city councilman back when I first came to Portland. When you were just a lad, yes. A lad, a mere wisp. Yes. So um, let's talk about that. So that, that kind of clears up the top of Mount Hood to the Willamette River from the Columbia into part of Clackamas. That's, that's a large and influential area. You got it's a great a district. Piece of Portland. So last week, you organized the Transportation Forum uh, downtown last, I believe it was last Monday, a week ago Monday, and you brought together a lot of people to talk about the changing infrastructure and the, actually the crumbling infrastructure that's going on both nationally and locally, our bridges, our highways, and how that affects our competition in the world today because I remember one of the things that stood out was the fact that in China, a bus comes every three minutes and a, gets a high speed train a high speed in train. Shanghai. In Shanghai. Good, good memory. You were paying attention. I certainly was. <laughs> yes. Well, it, it is important for us as a community to focus on this. Uh, the United States is falling apart and falling behind. Um, your reference to Shanghai, China was one that really caught my attention. Uh, Shanghai uh, has 13 subway lines. Uh, it has 20 major roads. Um, it's got two huge modern airports, uh, and one of them, uh, you can take a, a high-speed maglev train that goes like, I want to say, 240 miles an hour. It's an amazing experience. I've only done it a couple times, but it just opens your eyes. And a country that didn't have any high-speed trains five years ago now has one leaving in Shanghai every three minutes, and their high-speed rails in China will carry more passengers than the entire American airline fleet. So compared to what's going on in other countries, particularly China, um, we've got our work cut out for us. And in only five years. In five years. Now, we uh, had, as part of our focus, with that conversation at Portland State a week ago, bringing in people from all levels of government, private sector, state, transportation, uh, working uh, with uh, mayors, uh, people from across the river in Clark County, uh, because we've got some serious metropolitan transportation challenges, which are no secret to anybody, uh, particularly in the Metro East area. Uh, we have uh, some major problems, just basic things like sh sidewalks uh, so that children can get to school safely, for instance, or families can cross some of these roads. Um, and it stretches uh, from Sandy uh, into, uh, or from the city of Sandy to uh, problems on uh, streets like uh, Powell Boulevard. Um, we also have a, a challenge uh, the blue line, the original max line, was the first max line. Uh, but that 
line is now approaching 30 years old. Parts of it wow. are, shall we say, uh, showing their age. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had uh, significant um, uh, developments along that alignment, but there hasn't been any re major facelift to try and accept in Rockwood uh, to reorient it. And we've got a lot of facelifting to do in Rockwood. Um, this is the first time in 55 years that there is not a major transportation project in the pipeline with our federal partners. I remember that from the forum. I remember that was a, a major point that we have nothing in the tube right now going nothing. on. What is the biggest impediment to that? Well, the, the biggest problem is uh, simply that Congress for uh, the last 20 years has not done anything to add transportation resources. As you know, and maybe some of your uh, listeners are aware, uh, the federal transportation funding is primarily provided by an 18.4 cent per gallon gas tax. That gas tax has not been changed in 21 years. During that time, road and construction costs have gone up. Certainly. Probably significantly more than just inflation. Also, during that time, we're driving less. We, as individuals, for the last nine years, we've driven fewer miles per person every year for nine years. And we're driving more fuel efficient cars. Oh, so, yeah, so driving the less. Less the gas tax is low, so we're getting no money to, for infrastructure. Inflation, less money in the Highway Trust Fund, and that's going to continue to go down as we have more fuel efficient cars and we don't drive as much. So the failure, particularly over the last 10 years, to have adequate federal funding means that people are kind of scratching their head trying to figure out what to do and so we haven't been able to have a big six-year reauthorization with enough money and vision to move forward and that that has kind of put us in a bind here because we have relied on federal partnership for our major bridges for our freeways for max and for uh, streetcar so uh, we're in a bit of a fix. But we just got a one-year extension. I think that's what I heard. Well, what happened is that uh, the federal government actually was not, because of these, these forces of driving less, inflation, was not going to have enough money even to get to the end of this current little 27-month extension, which expires September 30th. Oh. So no money. In fact, there were parts of the country that were starting to cut back on road projects for things that were already approved and in some cases moving forward because there's no guarantee they'd be able to pay their bills. So this is a national, a federal, a federal uh, grant uh, problem. Yeah. So, so what we did just before we adjourned was uh, do what we do best and that was kind of a, a short term uh, dodge the bullet, put it down the road maybe even to the next Congress, which I think would be disaster. And we came up with uh, some, uh, some money from a variety of provisions that are really cats and dogs. It's not sustainable, it's not predictable, and it won't get us to where we need to go for the big picture stuff. So uh, that was the thrust of the conversation that uh, you were a part of uh, last uh, week. I really appreciate Metro East being there covering it so your viewers would be able to have opportunities to be a part of what I thought was a fascinating conversation. I think so too and the fact that we can actually give them the whole four hours instead of a snippet you know and here it is and you catch one here yeah. and a little there so that is the nice thing about and your support for community television so well, people can get it. Well today when people are so busy uh, there are so many demands uh, having Metro East provide in-depth coverage of things that would be significant if people knew about it, but right. it was four hours on a weekday morning 
um, and not everybody could do it or not everybody could do all of it. So I really appreciate this service that you're providing for your viewers. They can't get that anyplace else. No, they can't. And so, uh, I, well, so I appreciate the support. Um, well, moving on, um, you've had some, uh, actually not moving on, but the, the, the solution to this is raising the gas tax. Well, that's, that is one potential solution. I, uh, what we need to do is call this question. Because there are some people that say, we don't need a federal transportation program anymore. And they, uh, in fact, there was a proposal uh, last month when we were in the middle of this conversation uh, for this little short-term fix. There are some people that said, no, our solution is slash the federal gas tax and just turn this back to the states, let them do whatever they want, and not have a federal program. It's interesting that the wide variety of people who've been a part of this uh, debate in Congress, people ranging from the AFL-CIO to the U.S. Chamber, governors, environmentalists, truckers, and AAA representing all, all agree, no, we still need a federal transportation program. If we do, then we need to figure out whether we're going to be in a slow decline, because the, the budget that my Republican colleagues passed in the House will call for a 30% reduction below our already inadequate levels. Um, I personally think that it's time the federal government uh, considers raising the gas tax for the first time in 21 years. I've introduced legislation for that. If somebody's got a better answer, I'm all ears. But so far, I haven't heard something that is predictable, that is sustainable, and that is dedicated. Um, we're in the midst of, uh, while we're in the midst of this, however, I think it would, if, if my proposal were adapted, I think it should be the last time we ever raise the gas tax because I think we need to abolish it. It's no longer fair. It no longer collects enough money to meet our needs. And there was a time when the federal gas tax was a user fee that, that approximated the benefit that you and I got from driving. But now, uh, the gas tax does not relate to the actual benefit we get because you may drive a hybrid, I may drive an old beater, uh, and you, you know, have one of these little gas sipping vehicles, and so you pay almost nothing, but you're still congesting the roads, you're still taking up space, you're still part of the wear and tear. Maybe you've got uh, studded snow tires tearing up. Uh, I'm driving an old beater, I don't have studded snow tires. Uh, I don't drive as many miles, but my car isn't efficient. Uh, that's only going to increase in the future with plug-in hybrids. Uh, a friend visited uh, us this weekend. Um, they came over in an electric car. All right. No gas at all. No gas at all. So uh, Oregon, uh, as you know, has been experimenting for 10 years with the vehicle mile traveled fee instead of a gas tax to pay for our road use. In fact, uh, a pi the pilot project that's gone through two phases is extended next year to where 5,000 people can actually use this to pay their road use. So Oregon's a pioneer. I hope that this would be the only time that we'd ever raise the gas tax. And Oregon, which gave you the first gas tax dedicated to highway construction in 1919, 95 years ago, would pioneer how we'd get rid of it all together for something that's more fair and more sustainable. Full circle. Full circle. That's interesting. So for the viewers at home, the use tax means that they would check your gas mileage and then based upon mileage is the amount you would pay to re-register your car for the year, is well, that? Part of what we've been doing in Oregon, Robert, is to look at different ways of keeping track of the distance. And that was part of our second pilot project. There are some people that uh, had something that they could, an application they could have on their smartphone right. to keep track of distance. Uh, there are onboard com computers and navigation systems. In fact, our cars are turning into great big computers with wheels. Uh, so you could use that. You might want to do it the old-fashioned way, and every year when you go get your vehicle inspected to make sure that it's in Check compliance. Uh, have uh, an odometer reading. Some people may choose to just pay a great big fat flat fee, but give people choices 
Um, it would be better and fairer than the gas tax, and it might uh, make it possible to have other services because the same thing that would keep track of how far you go, not, not where you go, but how far you go, could also give you real-time traffic information. It could allow you to uh, not just pay for your road use, but pay for your parking, let you know where the closest vacant parking space is. Absolutely. There are things that could really revolutionize the driving experience, making it much more efficient and convenient. Well, just a quick aside, I know that cars are now able to communicate with each other on the road if they're in traffic so they can brake and they can keep distance and that's how we'll relieve some of the congestion. But, but mo moving on from there, um, you were able to pass some legislation before the Congress went on break about getting some of our Iraqi translators out of Iraq before or ahead of some of the new changes going over there because obviously they've been targeted. Um, can you tell us about that? Or Yeah, this has been uh, really an, an, an eight-year challenge. Um, I was uh, first introduced by some high school kids uh, about eight years ago to a young woman who was a translator for one of uh, our units of the National Guard and her life was threatened in Iraq. Uh, actually, I introduced the first legislation and worked with uh, the late Senator Kennedy to get it passed so that we had special visas to help these Iraqis. And then we were trying to help the people in Afghanistan that the Taliban is trying to track down. Uh, and it's been a real struggle. Uh, the latest challenge was that uh, these visas were all used up. We finally got it to work but there weren't enough of them. And we have over 6,000 just in Afghanistan alone in the pipeline. And we were able, in the midst of all the crankiness that last month, and it was not a pleasant month to be in Washington, trust me, uh, we were able to get my legislation on the floor. There was bipartisan support for it, and it passed. And we'll be able to save another 1,000 lives from the tender mercies of the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda. Yeah, I see where that's becoming another problem. They're, they're moving right in again to the, the Erbil area. And the ISIS, is that a whole new group of people that are attempting to take over the northern part of the country? Yeah, it's a, it's a different manifestation. I mean, we've had Al-Qaeda, we've had uh, various factions, but this uh, seems to have developed out of the uh, chaos and fighting uh, in Syria. And these are uh, uh, a, a little different uh, from what we've faced uh, with Al-Qaeda. Um, it's, I think, part of our future. It's one of the reasons I was so strongly opposed to the war in Iraq in terms of just opening Pandora's box, unleashing a series of forces we had no idea how to contain, and frankly, making uh, the United States a target of hatred uh, unifying these various sa factions who can't agree amongst themselves, but they can agree that they hate the United States. That's a very dangerous place for us to be in. It certainly is. Um, well, thank you so much for doing, introducing the legislation. It's always good to help those who have helped us rather than ignoring them. It brings to mind that old, uh, the end of the Vietnam War, where people were climbing the embassy to get into the helicopters to get out. Um, so you're coming right now from meetings in East County and, and Clackamas and, and Gresham. What are the future plans for here? What is it that you are looking at? We, you mentioned Rockwood and what's going on there. Well, um, I mean, obviously this is an area that is of great interest to me. Um, I went to Centennial High School. Oh. I, I have done uh, work uh, as a county commissioner uh, with what we used to call East Multnomah County with the smaller cities, uh, working with Gresham leadership. And since I've been in Congress, it's always been, uh, also been my privilege to represent uh, up to the top of Mount Hood. So you're, you're talking uh, about Government Camp, Sandy, Estacada. Um, and uh, we spent time in Sandy looking at some of the developments there, talking uh, to the local government. Um, we've had a number of uh, partnerships that have resulted, for example, in uh, there's just terrific transit service uh, for Sandy, their own little well, agency. Now they're, yeah. now they're connecting. Uh, they provide service to Estacada. 
No, no really? That's something I, I wasn't aware of. No. Uh, being able to understand what's going on, uh, tour some of the facilities, talk to the city council, um, and and then uh, in Gresham, uh, the in the past we've been able to secure some funding to help in the redevelopment of the Rockwood area. That's since I've been uh, in high school. That's been uh, a, a questionable, shall we say? Um, the city of Gresham has assembled. Uh, a tremendous amount of land for opportunity. We've been able to redesign that transit station. Uh, they have a renewal district, but the clock is ticking. Big plans about elements to include. Uh, and I wanted to, to just sort of see where we were at uh, and where there are opportunities going forward. I know that I, I lived in Rockwood for 11 years. I just moved out this summer and things had changed that were really not for the good, and yet now I have just been in contact with a, the former superintendent of Corbett Schools, who's trying to put in a world-class charter school. charter school there, yeah. uh, Bob Dunton, and uh, he was gonna be on a show we were gonna have this week, but for some political forces that has gone away for right now as they figured out with the Community Development Center for Rockwood, I don't know how that's going to, to flesh out, but obviously you're aware of it. Yeah, and, and that would be one of uh, the activities uh, adjacent to that Rockwood Center. Um, there are opportunities, I think, um, I'm, I mean, I went to the old Rockwood Library, uh, an opportunity perhaps for us to be able to give the community, which has grown and is increasingly diverse, uh, many languages spoken. Absolutely. Uh, huge challenges in terms of health and transportation and employment. Uh, this uh, vision that the city of Gresham has, I think, could uh, really help galvanize action, uh, focus things that others of us might be able to do to, to help. Um, the county has put in, uh, you know, the, the new facility there, the courthouse. Yes, um, that was beautiful. Uh, so there are... There are uh, a lot of moving pieces uh, that potentially could make a big difference in an area that has been uh, challenged and has, um, and, and has a long way to go in terms of uh, many of the problems that it faces. But it's in everybody's interest to make progress there. Absolutely. Do you think Gresham will uh, in the future absorb that area or will Rockwood gain its own government? No, I think it will continue to be part of the city of Gresham. That was part of the decision that was made uh, 25 years ago, uh, where uh, this was basically no person's land. It, was, it wasn't city of Portland, it wasn't city of Gresham, the other five smaller cities were you know, just off here. Uh, they didn't have municipal services um, uh, the, the, at the same degree. Um, I think it, Gresham made the decision, uh, the citizens out there made the decision to expand. I think it was the right choice. There are more tools that would be available. The county could not be the state's largest county and pretend like it was the state's second largest city. Uh, that was uh, not fair to the people who lived in Gresham and in Portland. Uh, and it wasn't fair to the people out there because it wouldn't give the, the, le the level of service that they wanted. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that Gresham will continue to uh, focus in this area and I'm hopeful that we can all find ways uh, to come together, whether it's the county or the federal government, uh, to help make sure that we give services to the people who need it and it's going to make the entire region stronger. It is. Well, it was unfortunate when they lost the Fred Meyer there, but they've made a beautiful center of the, of the Rockwood area there. It's very nice. Having the tram stations or the, the metro stations are nice. Um, so hopefully they will, you know, it, it will have a better development in the future if people take some good interest in it. Well, it's a great big blank canvas. Um, and there have been some people, as you know, who've done some of their own artistry ah, there. Yes, ah, yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we're going to see within the next year uh, some developments take place on site. Uh, but the big picture uh, is going to require those major commitments, and I'm looking forward to uh, working with the city of Gresham, with Multnomah County, with TriMet, 
uh, to see how far we can go to uh, pull those pieces together. Well, that's great. That's great. Um, I think that's all we have time for today, unless you had something else you wanted to talk about. No, no. no I, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity for us to swing by to visit with you about some of the things that we're doing uh, to uh, communicate with um, a, an important area that I represent. Uh, having grown up out here, uh, having been involved with efforts to try and make sure that uh, it's not an afterthought, uh, we have massive issues that we need to look at on the east side of the 205 freeway. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation with you as we can identify ways for economic opportunity, for improved transportation and public safety, um, the educational challenges, dealing with people uh, with mental problems. And we've got a long list of things we certainly that, do, uh, don't we? <laughs> that, that need our attention, uh, but where there are, I think, opportunities for us to make progress. And I appreciate the chance to have these conversations. Absolutely. You know, uh, the thing about improving transportation improves the job opportunities, <clears throat> improves people getting around. Uh, that's really the crux of the whole thing, right? And nationally as well as locally. So we're lucky to have you in Congress. I know that you're going to be heading out to try and get us a, a better Congress, right? And uh, we're all looking forward to that. And so we can maybe move ahead and, and accomplish some of the ideals that you espouse here. Thanks for your hospitality, Robert. Thank you so much for coming, and yeah. don't be a stranger. <laughs> I'm Robert Saines. We're at Metro East with Congressman Earl Blumenauer. <laughs>